Okay, and getting into chapter, uh, th the end of chapter three and into chapter four, I think um, this wedding uh, is an important aspect of things because uh, John, John the Baptist mentions it or mentions a wedding later. Um, John or uh, Jesus talks about a wedding in some of his parables. Jesus' parable about the wedding, I have taken to mean generally to come as you are, come in the clothes God gave you. Let's look for a moment at Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding banquet. Um, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepares a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have already prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field and another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. And the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to the servant, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come, so go to the street corners and invite the, to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes? We're without wedding clothes, my friend. The man was speechless. The, then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. So with that idea in mind and John 2 in front of us, let's ask some questions about this wedding. First, is Jesus actually here? In all the other Gospels, Jesus went out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted by the devil, immediately after being baptized by John. And when he left the wilderness, John was already in prison. But in John's version, Jesus is at a wedding banquet turning water into wine. But in John's version, Jesus is at a wedding banquet turning water into wine. There is no indication here of who is getting married. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples had been invited, but were they there? It doesn't say. Why is there no one here at this wedding? Could it be because there is someone here who is not wearing the clothes God gave him? Could it be there is someone who is not wearing the proper wedding clothes? Now, the point I get from the parable of the wedding banquet is is not to pretend to believe something I don't, and not to try to pretend to be what I am not. Every day should be lived with authenticity. But I think that much of what Jesus taught in Matthew, Mark, and Luke can be used with several positive outcomes. On the other hand, most of what Jesus teaches in John's Gospel leads to just as many possible interpretations, but they are almost always all deeply unsatisfying. And, um... The reason that I uh, came back to this, actually, was because of this, because I wanted to find out uh, what the first sign through which Jesus revealed his glory in Cana of Galilee. And this is it. He turned water into wine. What is the second sign that he shows them? Okay, the second sign that he shows them is incredibly unimpressive. So the first sign was turning water into wine at a wedding that apparently very few people were invited to. or And then the second sign was seen by exactly one man. The second sign was, was this. Jesus uh, said, go, your son will live. And the man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was still living. When he inquired as to the time his, when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. So once again, John's Gospel is based on the testimony of a single man, because only the father only the father of this boy knew the exact time which Jesus said this to him and only 
and he, he really wouldn't have been able to confirm that completely. So anyway, regardless of whether I believe that this is um, the truth, what John is doing is reporting hearsay. All right, um, where was I? Okay, I was at John 3.22. That's where I really left off. He says, after this, and after this is kind of a strange thing in John's Gospel because he had been teaching Nicodemus, and before he was teaching Nicodemus, it was almost time for the Jewish Passover. Now, I think John is playing with time right here uh, to... Uh, to get Jesus to throw himself down um, because he thinks what it was uh, more important to uh, get these things in the same order as the temptations of the devil rather than to get them in the chronological order. So there was after this, and then in this part there is now, and finally there is after this. This is after he tells Nicodemus that the people love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil, which is, seems really backwards to me. People's deeds are evil because they don't understand what to do to do good at the same time as they want to survive, and they don't understand uh, a proper... They don't understand what to value properly. Um, I think if people knew what was truly valuable and what was temptation, then their deeds would not be evil because they would do what they uh, put value in. But because uh, John's Gospel does not explain the difference between right and wrong, it only it, it uh, just accuses people of doing wrong all the time. So, let's see how John testifies about Jesus. John testifies um, nothing. John does not say anything. Uh, where does it say? Well, John testifies about Jesus, but he does. what does he say about himself? John says, You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. This to me seems a curious turn of phrase. It is as though he is not testifying it him he is not testifying it himself, but he is telling his followers to testify that I am that he is not the Messiah. This kind of uh brings about like it puts some thoughts into my mind. Like someone could actually claim to be the Messiah to his near friends, but tell them to not say tell them not to to tell anyone else that he's the Messiah, or vice versa, tell people that guy is the Messiah, but don't let them know that he's really, but even though he is not testifying to be the Messiah. And um, here we have uh, the bride belongs to the bridegroom, the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him, and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. Now, I don't know exactly how to read that, but it does make me think back to the bride, and or to the bridegroom that was discussed in the early, at the beginning of chapter 2. So let me count the ways that this looks suspicious. First, in the other Gospels, John and Jesus are not preaching at the same time. John is, in, or Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days, and when he comes back, John is in prison. Uh, in and two, John's Gospel just now discussed a wedding where Jesus and his disciples were invited. Jesus was not the bridegroom, but just there, and uh, it could arguably arguably seemingly not even wearing wedding clothes. Jesus is serving up alcohol, which John was forbidden by his father Zechariah from ever drinking. 
if john the baptist is currently thinking about a wedding who was the bridegroom at that wedding if john the baptist is currently thinking about a wedding who was the bridegroom at that wedding who was the master of the banquet and was the master of the banquet let's see who was the master of the banquet and was the master of the banquet really happy that Jesus had brought out the best wine after the guests had had too much to drink. I do not have the final correct answer to these questions. I ask many questions. All of these are various hypotheses, and I hope that by carefully weighing these hypotheses, I can come to find a deeper truth. My main suspicion, though, is that everything John says is a riddle, a half-truth, or filled with such ambiguity that we can never truly know what he means. And in my opinion, that's really all I have to show. Because one does not achieve wisdom by understanding lies, but by understanding truth. Here, it's interesting because it sounds like John is describing Jesus as the bridegroom and himself as the bridegroom's friend the friend who attends the bridegroom. Now, that kind of puts him in a separate position than the bride. Now, John says he's, his joy is the joy of the bridegroom, and he says the bridegroom must become greater and I must become less. Now, some, it says here, H, uh, some interpreters in the quotation with verse 36. So some people put all of this in the quotes of John the Baptist. Um, this sounds like, to me, like John, John the Disciple. So, uh, question, is this John the Disciple or John the Baptist? It depends on where you put the quote signs. I think this is John the Baptist. I think John the Baptist uh, is the only one that goes on like this all this all of these threatening words about rejecting the sun um, whereas you know in the other gospels in the other gospels it's not about whether you're accepting the sun or not accepting the sun but whether you come to the wedding wearing your own wedding clothes Kingdom of Heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Just to repeat this, because the uh, the analogy is so perfect. He sent some some servants and said, "Tell those who have been invited that they I have prepared my dinner. He's got everything ready. Everybody is, and the king nobody's paying attention. Nobody is saying Jesus is Lord. Uh, he, people." The servants are being mistreated and killed. The king is enraged. He sends his army out and destroys the murderers and burns their cities. And he says to the servants, a bank wedding banquet what is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the streets and corners and invite, the bank invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all sorts of people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. So there's people all over now uh, who are who have filled the banquet table. Uh, all of these, all of, well, basically all of these Christians that are around. And then when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, "How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend?" And the man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing and te of teeth. So who is this man who, did, who got in without wedding clothes? Who is this man that gets everyone drunk on crappy wine and is saving the best until now? Interesting. This does not say whether the master of the banquet is happy or sad <laughs> it says is everyone brings out the, cho the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink but you have saved the best till now now most people look at that and go oh the bridegroom the 
the master of the banquet is very happy. But I think the next words that the master of the banquet says, the master of the banquet says, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? And the words after that are, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs>